Uh, this morning, I'd like to talk about Sati Sampajanya, mindfulness and clear understanding. The, the practice that we're doing, usually in English known as insight meditation, is an approach to meditation developed by the Buddha which emphasizes the role of what he, uh, he called sati, what we call mindfulness. And sati is essentially presence, the action of staying present. And we notice as soon as we start to meditate that a lot of the time we are not present. A lot of the time we are absent. A lot of the time, in fact, most of the time, we're not particularly mindful. So we're, we're reversing our normal pattern of behaviour. Most of the time, normally, we're absent. Now we're training ourselves to become present. And this action of becoming present has two aspects. One is what we're present to, what is it that's happening, and the other is simply the more general becoming present to anything. So we give ourselves something to become present to in the formal meditation practice. We give ourselves a meditation object. So stay present to this. At other times, it's more general. In the break periods, in the, in the meal times, and so on. There's nothing specific, necessarily, that we're trying to be mindful of, but we're trying to be mindful, we're trying to be present to whatever is happening. The Buddha, when he talked about sati, he would also talk about sampajanya. And often it appears in a compound, sati sampajanya. In other words, it's a collection. Sampajanya is variously translated. A classic translation is clear comprehension. Sometimes you see it translated as clear awareness, which I don't think is very good. I think it misses something. I like to translate it as clear understanding. Sampajanya is the intelligence associated with presence. So presence is simply, this is it. But when we are present, we develop understanding. There's an intelligence associated with presence. So mindfulness and clear understanding, or intelligent presence, uh, cultivating this is the essence of this practice. In the uh, discourses, the Buddha has one discourse in particular where he lays out the path of satipatthana, of insight meditation. And there's a section which is marked as the section on sampajanya, clear understanding. And this is what it says. Here the Buddha is describing the practitioner. When walking, a practitioner knows she is walking. When standing, she knows she is standing. When sitting, she knows she is sitting. When lying down, she knows she is lying down. Whatever way her body is placed, she knows that is how it is. When going forward or going back, a practitioner clearly understands what she is doing. When looking forward or looking back, she clearly understands what she is doing. When bending and stretching, she clearly understands what she is doing. When carrying her inner and outer robe and her bowl, she clearly understands what she is doing. When eating, drinking, chewing and tasting, when shitting and pissing, when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep and waking up, speaking or staying silent, she clearly understands what she is doing. Now, when you look at this, first of all, you notice the simplicity of it. Whatever it is that we're doing, we know this is what we're doing we clearly understand this is what we're doing. It couldn't get much simpler. And you notice also the centrality of the body. All of this is directed towards understanding what the body is doing at any given time. So the role of the body is really crucial. In Satipatthana Sutta, which we're going to be looking at, there are four foundations of mindfulness or applications of mindfulness. And the first one is body. In other words, the practice begins with the body. So our relationship to body is really central to this practice. For the Buddha, this is obvious because of his 
understanding of what the human being is. In the European tradition, we inherit a long tradition of dualism, where we think that the human being consists of two quite separate and distinct aspects. There's body and there's mind. And these operate not quite, but almost independently. And the body's over there, mind's over there, and every now and again they get together for a bit of a chat. For the, for the Buddha, he has a different understanding of what a human being is. One a phrase that he uses to describe a human being is sat vinyana kaya. Kaya is body, vinyana is consciousness, and sat means with. A body together with consciousness, or a sentient body. So a human being is a body. If you don't have a body, you don't have a human being. But it's not simply a body, but a sentient body. A body that knows. A body that experiences. And of course, a body that is experienced by other bodies. So the physicality of the human being is, is quite clear and central to the Buddha's understanding of, of what it is to be a human being. And Therefore, the, our relationship to the body is very important. Usually, particularly in our culture, we're quite cut off from the body. For example, in walking. If you, you know, have the experience of, say, walking to the bus stop when you've got to catch a particular bus, and if I don't get this bus, I'll be late, and then I'll, then I'll be in trouble, and then I have to rearrange my day, and blah 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 So charging off to the bus stop. Usually, at, at this point, the head's forward, the brow is furrowed, and the reality is completely in the head, totally. And as I'm rushing to the bus stop, I'm totally cut off from the body. I've got no idea what's going on, because my reality is purely in the fantasy, which is in the future. I arrive at the bus stop and there's still people standing around there, so I know that I've, I've made it in time. And there's a moment when I relax. Ah, oh, phew. And in that moment, suddenly, I'm back in the body. But it's only for a moment because then I take up another narrative. Oh, okay, so I'm not going to be like, therefore, bloody, 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 bloody. And I'm back in the head and out and disconnected from the body. And it's interesting in, in the practice, if you notice when you're sitting there and then there's distraction and there's a period of time when we're in the fantasy, the moment that we come out of the fantasy, check the body. Has it moved? Quite possibly. Often that's when we slump, for example. Did we notice it? No. Because we weren't there. So the relationship to the body is really quite central. And it's, in a sense, in one way that we can see it is it's a, the dichotomy between being in the body, which is always present, and being in the mind, which is caught up with past and future. So coming back to the body is coming back to the present. So the relationship to body is quite central. And during the retreat, we really start to focus on this relationship. We're not going anywhere. And so when we, when we move, we can really settle in on being with the movements themselves. In a sheltered workshop situation like this, particularly once we get to know the territory and the routine, there's no particular need to be preoccupied with the destination. So we can settle into just the movement itself, just moving. So this whole sense of what's happening with the body right now becomes centrally important in this practice. It begins with posture. Posture in the sense of the general arrangement of the body. You notice how in this section the Buddha begins with, when walking a practitioner knows she is walking, when standing she knows she is standing, when sitting she knows she is sitting, 
when lying down she knows she's lying down. He begins with the four postures. It's like the most general sense of the body. What's the body doing now? Is it sitting? Is it standing? Is it moving? Is it lying down? And then from there into the detail. Where if we're talking about posture in that broad sense, we're talking about a wide field of awareness. It's not specific, it's wide open. The body, in, in terms of general posture, how is the body right now? Is it light? Is it heavy? Is it relaxed? Is it tense? Is it still? Is it moving? Is it balanced? Is it out of balance? What's the body doing now? Whatever way her body is placed, she knows that is how it is. So working with posture is really useful to get established, to get into the body and into the present. In the sitting, we emphasize constructing the posture. In the morning, in the exercises, we spend a lot of time standing. It's not an accident. We're learning how to construct a standing posture. You start with the contact, the feet on the ground, find the balance, lift up through the centre. In the sitting, the same thing, finding the, the front of the buttock bone, getting that foundation, that connection, and then lifting up through the centre of the body. If we're on a chair, the contact of the feet on the ground also. And getting a sense of the whole body the energy flowing through it and from there we can tune into the movement within the body which is the breathing. But the breathing is not disconnected from the rest of the body, it's part of this whole sense of the body. In the walking, start with the standing, construct the standing, you've got your walking track and then starting doing the walking, bringing the awareness down into the feet and into the contact, but not cutting off from the body as we do that. Again, that's quite easy to do, particularly if we're striving, straining to keep the awareness on the feet. Sometimes if there's too much effort to stay with the feet, then it's like walking to the bus full of thinking about what's going to happen if we don't get there on time. We cut off from the body and we don't notice what's going on further up. And that's when we, when we notice, is when we start to realise that the shoulder hurts or the body feels really stiff and we decide we don't really like walking meditation. But if we stay with the whole body, and so this sense of the awareness coming down, but sweeping through the whole body and staying in touch with the body as we walk, making the whole thing as natural as possible Slowing down, but allowing yourself to slow down, not forcing yourself to slow down. We slow down because we want to appreciate the view. It's like if you're going through the garden. The natural tendency is to walk slowly. Why? Because that way you can appreciate the detail. You can see what's going on. In the same way in the walking meditation, we slow down because we want to, because we want to appreciate the detail. We want to see what's going on. Until then, don't force it. If you force it, again, the, the mind, the idea, the image, forces the body to do something, and we cut off from the body. So we, don't, we cease to be sensitive to it. But the whole point is to get into the body and to flow with the body. So if that happens to be faster than the person walking beside you, fine. It's not a problem. So it's coming back again and again to the body. And the two things in particular that we're working with in the body are movement and touch. In the walking meditation, for instance, movement, the body's cruising up and down, and touch, the impact of the foot on the ground. In the sitting meditation, touch, the, the contact with the ground in particular, contact of hand on hand or hand on legs or whatever, internal touch, the, the sensations, movement, 
what is breathing, it's movement, sensed in the body, and movement also the adjustments to the posture that we go through as we sit. So again and again, when we work with body, really what it comes down to mostly, not exclusively, but mostly is movement and touch, internal movement, external movement, internal touch, external touch. And as we become more intimate with the body, we, by doing so, become more intimate with mind. How do we know that we've got a body? Well, we experience it. What is it that's doing the experiencing? It's the mind. You can't separate body from mind, or mind from body. If there's body, there's mind. If there's mind, there's body. So, by becoming intimate with body, we are becoming intimate with mind. And the relationship to mind then starts to, to change. But we'll be talking more about that as we get through, go through the retreat. This awareness of body and mind, with, but with the emphasis on body, is central to getting into this understanding of sati, of mindfulness. Then, clear understanding, some pajanya, when there's this mindfulness, then the clear understanding begins to develop. The clear understanding functions as a kind of meta-awareness, an ability to, to monitor what's going on. So it's like we have the expression to witness the experience. If there's a witnessing, it's like there's a, somehow a, a stepping back from the situation just to, to witness it. And from that witnessing, there's an understanding emerging. Oh, this is what's happening. This is how it works. So clear understanding refers to this general sense of monitoring the experience, monitoring what's going on. And monitoring or understanding involves an appreciation of context. We'll be talking more about this as the retreat goes on, but Essentially, when we start, when we're applying a meditation method, got the meditation object and just got to stay with it. So the attitude is really focused on just this inhalation, just this exhalation, just this, just this, just this, just this. It's a very, it's a very much kind of in your face, just stay with it kind of experience. Um, this is the mindfulness aspect. The clear understanding aspect is at some point, we get a broader picture. It's like every, every moment that we are deliberately aware, it's like a dot, pump, here, 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 here. The clear understanding aspect is recognizing that there's a pattern in the dots, joining the dots. It's like those kiddies books where you have lots of dots and you find a picture by joining the dots. And then you can step back and say, ah, this is what's going on. So clear understanding operates like that. It's a, it comes as a kind of a stepping back from the detail of the experience and beginning to appreciate the patterns, what's emerging out of this. And so when we talk about insight, really what we're talking about is an appreciation of patterns. But in order to appreciate a pattern, we have to see what it is that's being patterned. We have to get in there and be present to the detail of the experience, moment after moment. This implies a broader view. One of the images that the Buddha gives is it's like someone is sitting and then somehow they divide into two. You step back and stand behind this person sitting, look down on them. When you do this, you get the broad picture. You get the whole sense of what's going on. The person sitting has a, has a particular view and it's quite focused but narrow. But the person standing behind that person gets a broader picture. So this is the opening out that creates the opportunity for insight, for understanding, to emerge. At the most basic level, this monitoring, this clear understanding, involves the understanding 
right now, am I present or absent? And this in itself is a challenge. You notice how when we're distracted, we don't know that we're distracted. It's like we wake up in the middle of a distraction. So there's a period of time when we don't know at all what's going on. We are absent, but we don't know that we're absent. And then suddenly we know, ah, I'm absent. I'm out to lunch. This is clear understanding. Am I present right now or am I absent? If I'm present, what am I present to? What's happening? If I'm absent, how did that happen? What just happened? So we develop this questioning, investigative attitude to experience. We're not thinking about it, but we're just watching with a question mark. What's happening? How did this happen? And knowing what we are doing and how. And these two aspects are the mindfulness, what we are doing, and the clear understanding. How? How did this come about? And then clear understanding develops into a more sophisticated sense of how we engage with the practice. Is the practice working or not? How does it work? How do I maintain connection with the meditation object? How do I lose it? What do I have to culti cultivate? What do I have to avoid? And so on. So the whole sense of skill as a meditator that develops over time is part of this clear understanding. But the clear understanding, which you know, develops over time, begins with a basic awareness of the body. This is where we start with. In the sitting and the walking, these are the two formal practices most emphasised, but there's also the lying down and the standing. So in the formal meditation exercises, where we work with this in great detail, and then there's the daily activity out beyond the, the formal meditation exercises, staying with the body. What is the body doing now? How is it moving? And emphasising movement and touch. The body's always moving and the body's always touching something. Movement and touch are always available, so they're very good to focus on. What's the body doing right now? What's its posture? How is it moving? Is it balanced? Is it imbalanced? Is it reaching out? Is it stepping back? And so on. So allowing yourself to slow down and staying alert and staying with the body. From this general sense of the body, insight can arise. So it's not a matter of first struggle, struggle, struggle to, to get some concentration and then something can happen. Something can happen at any time. All we have to do is to be present. And what we emphasise first is to be present with the body. Any questions? Yeah, Barbara Lee. Mm -hmm. that I'm, um, I'm absent mm -hmm. and then I notice I'm absent and I make the decision, I make the choice to come back mm -hmm. into the present. But when the concentration starts to build up, then the experience can be different that I'm absent and I'm not even realising that I'm absent, I'm just suddenly totally present mm -hmm. without making that choice. <coughs> Yeah, this is, this is very common. Uh, at first it's like, and I'm just repeating it for the recording because I'm not quite sure how much of this is getting through. Um, at first we notice that we're absent and then we have to choose, got to come back into presence. Then later on as, con as the concentration develops, it just, boom, happens. So by concentration we mean the mind is becoming stronger, more still and more unified. 
And as that happens, it's not, I suspect, that the choice stops. It's rather the choice has now become habitual. And the mind just makes that choice and acts upon it. Because the choice is not self. In the early stages, I have a very strong sense that I am making the choice. Because I'm building up the momentum. But the choice is always not self. It arises because of conditions. The desire to be, to be meditating, the desire for a, a, a good experience. But then that choice becomes habitual, so it drops beneath the radar. And I don't notice it because it's a habit, a, a very positive habit. And so the choice keeps being made, but it happens much faster. And the mind that's making it is much more powerful. And so we just don't notice it. So we book back again. The other thing I think which is happening is our, our sensitivity to presence. So for example, you said, I notice that I'm absent, and then I make the choice to come back to presence. But as soon as you notice you're absent, you're already present. You're present to absence. But because it's not so, the mind isn't so strong, it's not so obvious. But then it becomes more obvious. And the moment that we're present, it's, that's it. It's, and then the mind will, will seek out its meditation object. But it'll do it by itself. We don't need to direct it. So I think it's, it's basically the same process, but it's becoming stronger. It, the difference is the, is the samadhi, the concentration. The mind is becoming stronger, faster, more powerful. And so the, whole, the, the feel of the whole process changes. But it's essentially the same process. Yeah, the jo- often insight first pops up as an accident. It's one of the delicate things about teaching insight. You know, you can't teach insight. Someone either gets it or they don't get it. And we've all had the experience, for example, of, of hearing a meditation instruction for years. And then suddenly one day, oh, that's what they mean. <laughs> and, and, and you hear it for the first time. What, you know, what happens there? It's like something clicks. Suddenly the mind sees something, it recognises a pattern. Uh, until that pattern is recognised, it's just blarty, blarty, blarty. But as soon as it's recognised, ah, bingo. That's what it is. And you can't force that. You can't make it happen. It happens when the mind is right. So what we do is the method. The, me- the method gives us something to do to keep us busy. And we're waiting for something to happen. What we're waiting for is, ah, the insight. Ah, that's, oh, this is it. But it's, it's, a create, it's a kind of creative waiting. When we're ready for it, it'll happen. It's quite strange. It's, it's like the, the relationship between the active and the receptive. And both are very important. There has to be an activity. We have to do something. Because otherwise we'll just drift according to our normal habits. So we have the method and the discipline to keep doing this, to keep doing it. The receptive aspect is the just being there for whatever happens. And at some point, insight will happen. The, the question for us is, are we there for it when it happens? Are we there waiting for it? And if we are, I think Krishnamurti once gave the image of insight is like a breeze coming through an open window. You can't make the breeze blow, but you can open the window. (laughs) So the method is simply about opening the window and keeping it open. And when the breeze comes, we're there for it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. then the mind can easily shut that down and ignore it or, or um, suppress it. Mm-hmm. So, so I guess what I'm asking is if that does happen, then <coughs> you 
need to take that somewhere else, that emotion or that feeling, investigate it further, then kind of break through it. So the question is about negative emotion, which means painful emotion. Painful emotion, but you just, but just it, so it keeps coming up, keeps coming yeah. up. Obsessive, painful emotion. Yeah, well, yeah, obsessive. Um, necessarily always painful, but just something that, that's a block. Mm. Do you know what I'm trying to say? I think so. So, and, and the tendency is to, to suppress it. Yeah, because you know how our mind is very powerful. Yeah. Um, it will, um, it's like that habitual thing that you were talking about. Habit. Yeah. So, our mind can be very clever, can't it? And, and um, find all sorts of ways One thing that does become apparent as you do this practice is precisely what you're calling the negative patterns. Mm. Uh, they, be, they become very obvious. Mm. If you're doing this style of retreat, there are two things that should become really obvious. One is your buttock bones, and the other is your negative patterns. <laughs> So it's, it's, the practice is, is designed to expose them. Mm. This is what the Buddha calls the asavas, um, the taints, that which flows out of the, the depths of the unconscious. Mm. And these movements are quite independent of us. In the sense, we're up here, kind of making our choices and living our lives, but then being sabotaged by these, these forces that keep, keep coming up. So the practice is designed to expose them. Mm. And this, is, this whole idea about the secondary object, if I, if I only have a primary object and these things come up, well, I can use the power of the meditation to shove them aside. The Buddha talks about this is serenity practice, and it's perfectly valid. He, he talks about if you're just developing concentration, it's like you have water that's clogged with water weeds and, and so on, and you place in it this really big, porous clay pot. And so it's just floating on the surface. But gradually the water starts to absorb into the pot. And as this happens, the pot gets heavier and heavier. And as it gets heavier, it sinks. And it pushes down all the water weeds. And so inside the pot, you've got perfectly clear water. Outside, you've got clogged with water weeds. So the pot full of water is the power of the concentrated mind. It suppresses the defilements, the taints, the obsessions. With, with the power of it. So inside that meditative mind, clear, radiant, peaceful. But outside, it's a mess. But it's very, it's very good training because at some point, the pot goes away, poof, and you've stuck with the weeds again. So in this practice, the secondary object starts to open you out. So you notice, what is it that pulls me away from my concentration. Why, what is it that pulls me away from finding ease? It's the, my disturbances. So and then if I train myself, okay, well what is it? Look at it. N note it. Be deliberately aware of it and even name it. I see you. The, the Buddhist devil is Mara and Mara had a, a number of encounters with the Buddha and his awakened disciples and these encounters always end when the person says, I see you, Mara. <laughs> it's like, he always comes disguised. Uh, but when he's seen, that's it. it the game, game over. So it's like seeing it and then come back to the primary object. So what we're doing is training ourselves to open up to that. But, keeping, but with the primary object, we're keeping that stability, that centre of stability, and, keeping, and getting it stronger and stronger. So that centre of stability expands to include the obsessions. Then we drop our normal defences. We allow the obsessions to come up. We stay with it, noting it, until it goes away, which it does. And it just becomes incorporated, just becomes another part of the experience. That way, they emerge, they do their thing, and they cease. And we see their fundamental emptiness, that they arise because of conditions and cease because of conditions we realise it's not me. It's just this obsession, which comes and goes dependent upon conditions. And so everything starts to loosen up and we become, begin to become free of them. But we become free from them by including them. 
within the context of the method. We'll be talking more about this as we go through. Yeah. Boredom. Um, yes, sir, when you're talking about the, the sense of the rising and falling, mm. um, I think I've used the, the nostrils, and um, so I, I sort of try it this way, but I, I found I just didn't have enough to do. And if I have if I have pinpoints, pinpoints along the way, it keeps me busy, um, and I just get bored so easily if I'm only just rising and falling, and it's just not. Is Do you find that it's not specific enough, the rising and falling, whereas no, the nostrils, it's, it's, it's much it's more... Okay, it's you just you don't find it. Okay, and then stay with the nostril then. Um, but even then I have to make, you know, pin, uh, landmarks along the way so I don't wander. Uh -huh. um, anyway, I mean, it all comes back to boredom. Yeah. Yeah, and boredom comes back to an absence of awareness. If mindfulness is weak, there's boredom. If mindfulness is strong, there's no boredom. One of the basic pragmatic problems that any meditator has when we begin is finding a good primary object. And the off-the-shelf one doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily the right one. Some meditators have to hunt around before they, they finally find what is their primary object. A certain proportion of meditators can't really connect with this. It's too general and, it's, and they can't really hold on to it. Others do, others love it. Some meditators find that the breath of the nose tip is really good it, because they say, look, it's, it's quite clear, it's precise, it's in a, in a particular area and it's just there. And so, great, that's your primary object. For some meditators, breathing is not a particularly good primary object, despite the fact that you know it's almost the, the almost universal meditation object. For some people, it doesn't work particularly well, and they shouldn't use it. So, always as a rule of thumb, go for what is clearest. That's your primary object. Secondly, don't expect that it's necessarily the same thing all of the time. You can shift your primary object according to, to patterns. So when one thing isn't clear, maybe something else is. But is it good to do that within, say, the same session? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. yeah. What you're looking for is a continuity of awareness. So you can get that in one of two ways, broadly speaking. One is you have a single object all the way through, and you're just being continuously aware of one thing. And that's emphasising the continuity of the object. Therefore, you get the continuity of the awareness. Another way is the flip side, which is you have a variety of different objects but maintaining a continuity of awareness with them, which is actually how this method works. So if you're moving from primary object, secondary object and back again, what have you got? You've got a discontinuity of meditation object but a continuity of awareness. So you're training yourself in that from the very beginning. And then <coughs> as you get better at that, you can become very skillful with it. It can be wide open in terms of the primary object, but you just, this flow of awareness, staying with it. So, you start to experiment. One thing that I would do, for example, is, okay, get into the sitting posture and begin by noting sitting. Sitting is the whole posture, the sense of the whole body. Uh, so it's a wide field. And then ask yourself, what's the clearest aspect of this right now? And it may be breath, it may be the two obvious things to look for would be breathing and touch sensation, particularly in the lower part of the body. Whatever is clearest, oh, go there. Then pull back. What's the clearest thing now? Pull, pull back. What's the clearest thing now? And each time you do that, you're not anticipating what it might be. You don't know until you look. So you have to be sharp, you have to be attentive. So you're working on the mindfulness and the energy. But you're looking for, okay, what's clearest now? Boom. What's clearest now? Sure. Boom. And then you start to get into a rhythm. You start to get to see the pattern. You start to get to see, well, what is clearest? You don't know yet what it is. And then you start 
moving the point of awareness around according to a rhythm. Not too slow. If, you, if it's too slow, you fall asleep in between time. Not too fast, you get restless. And then you start to, to get a sense of, okay, this is what's clear. It may be, for example, sometimes the nose is clear, sometimes the pressure of the buttocks is clear, sometimes the rising and falling is clear. You may find just you know, a few things which tend to be fairly high up. These are the things you tend to go to. So then you start refining that, start working on those. And then you just learn to shift from one to the other as need be. And it keeps you awake and alert because you don't know what it's going to be. So you have to be awake. And it keeps you directed towards what's clearest. So it keeps you sharp and keeps you present. In other words, don't be mechanical about it. Particularly with this idea of the primary object, don't be mechanical about it. It's, it's an alive engagement. And boredom is an interesting indication. And boredom means that mindfulness is weak. Because if mindfulness is strong, you can't be bored. So you know that you have to uh, crank up the energy and the investigation. But if you're stuck in a particular narrow pattern of what you think the practice is, and there's nothing in there that's satisfying, then that's when it doesn't work. You know, where does the attention naturally go? It goes to where you, what you're interested in. So you make it interesting. You start to play around. And when we have the interviews, then that's the sort of thing that we talk about. Like, how, how's the game going? <laughs> Who's winning? <laughs> so be, be, start to be creative with it. Meditation objects can be beyond the body. Some traditions use them. Here, if you're using sight, there's no particular thing you, you look at. So, for example, you may be simply sitting there with the eyes open and you note seeing, seeing. And so you're just staying with the visual field, whatever it is. And similarly, when you're walking around and so on, just staying with the visual field. Hearing is another possibility. In my experience, more people would use sound as a meditation object than sight. It's somehow easier to, to hook onto, but individual differences vary greatly. Anything can be a meditation object. But again, it's the, it's the question is, what can you hook onto? What's clear to you? what is interesting for you and what can you hook onto and sustain that for a period of time. The primary object, the job of the primary object is to sustain attention over time. You've got to have something that you can stay with and track over a period of time. Yeah, choiceless awareness is an interesting phrase. I think it was Krishnamurti who developed it. From a, from a Buddhist perspective, choiceless awareness is what happens when mindfulness becomes very strong. Equanimity becomes strong. And then it's, it just opens up and the mind will be aware of what the mind is aware of. It's not necessarily that there's no choice. It's that the choice is, has dropped a bit beneath the radar and it's, it's not being noticed anymore. But it's, it's associated with a, much, with a very wide open, anything can be a meditation object. Where you've got that going, it means you, you've got equanimity. The equanimity is strong. But if the equanimity isn't strong, you can't sustain it. It just collapses. So with people who practice choiceless awareness, usually the problem is, A, how do I get there? And B, how do I sustain it once I'm there? So some methods are designed to take you there as soon as possible and to keep you there. This one works differently. This one is, as you can see, much more directive. But the idea is that by being directive, you build up the mind to the point where it just naturally starts to open out into that choiceless awareness. It'll, it, it manifests as a stage of maturity within the practice. You don't have to do it. You don't have to choose choiceless awareness. <coughs> it chooses you. So it's... It's kind of the different ways that people go about constructing a meditation method. 
And there's many different ways of doing it. And some methods ap appeal to, to some people and not to others. Like some people are very intuitive in the way that they practice and they don't want to be burdened with method. They don't need it. Other people are much more method-oriented. I'm much more method-oriented because as a practitioner, I was pretty hopeless. You know, I'm not a naturally gifted meditator by any stretch of the imagination. And so for me, learning meditation was a huge struggle because I didn't know what to do and I needed someone to tell me what to do. So for me, learning method was very important and understanding, oh, this is, what I, this is how it works. Now I, can, now I can figure it out. So that when I teach, that's what I emphasise. But for some people, it's like that's just, why do you do that? That's nonsense. You just do it. That's good. Uh, because that's the way their mind works. So you, you get a huge variety of approaches to meditation, in part dependent upon the kinds of minds that are meditating. Yeah. Yeah. A question about pain. Pain pulls you away from the primary object and keeps you there. Pain is an excellent primary object. Some teachers thoroughly recommend it and, <laughs> and find it as very good news to hear that you're having a lot of pain. <laughs> because, as you say, it compels attention. So it's a great primary object. Except that it's got two disadvantages. One is aversion arises. And the aversion has to do with resistance. So, God, no, no, God, get me out of here. Yeah. And so then you get a, a struggle going on, which makes it problematic. The other thing with pain is that you do have to be careful about whether or not you're doing yourself injury with an artificial posture. As a rough rule of thumb, well, first of all, if you stay still, you will get pain because the, body is inher the, the body's inherent pain will start to manifest in some way. So you, there's no such thing as pain-free meditation, except when you're in deep concentration, which suppresses the pain. So there's pain which is a normal part of the meditation, and there's pain which is the body telling you, don't do this to me. And part of the skill of the meditator is to learn to tell the difference. As a rough rule of thumb, pain in muscle is not a serious problem because muscle can stretch and it can relax and it can find its, find its way. Pain in joints can be more problematic. Joints don't stretch. I remember when I was in my early days, we, in Sydney Zen group, we used, people had the expression in retreat, I just got to, you know, the, the knees would hurt, we just got to stretch out the knees after a few days, it's okay. And then, of course, years later, I realised, wait a minute, knees don't stretch. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a physiological fact. <laughs> Muscle up here stretches, and often knee pain is actually referred from here, from, from the quadricep. That's why we do those leg stretches in the morning. So by stretching out leg muscles, often okay, knee pain disappears. But if, if there is a problem with the knee, you've got to be careful. Joints, you've got to be careful. You, you can damage yourself. This is part of sensitivity to posture. But as a, as a rule of thumb, pain is an excellent meditation object if you can just stay with it for what it is and not get freaked out by it. As a rule of thumb, when working with pain, the best advice that I got was with one friend of mine, actually, who's a long-time meditator and he spent the first, I don't know, it was between 20 and 30 years of his meditation career working with serious pain. And so he became very good at it. And, um, and he said, you should settle into the pain like you settle into your favourite easy chair. In other words, no resistance. No aversion, in other words. Just ease into it, relax into it. Often with the out-breath. So as you breathe out, just relax into the pain. Relax into the centre of it, where it hurts the most and just relax into it. Uh, and that will 
both allow the concentration to develop, but also if, it, if the pain is because the body is tensing, that will help the body to relax. And so if it is just muscular, it'll, it'll go away anyway. But yeah, we can talk about it more as the retreat progresses. It's a very good meditation object. Yeah. So I start to, you know, sort of mentally say it's going to relax. It's a catch to relax. It's just how great is there a conversation going on along with the muscle until it relaxes and mm. then I find something else. Mm. And I find it really quite pleasurable mm. <laughs> to do that. But is that a danger to sort of concentrate on relaxing the stiff parts of your body? Because it's no. Th- I notice that when you're talking about the stiff parts, you're, you're indicating the upper body. Roughly speaking, you get pain in the lower body because of pressure, uh, because of the way that the, you know, the knees and so on. Pain in the upper body often has to do with knots of tension that are developed over time, which can be relaxed with good posture. Often it's what, you, what we focus on when we discover pain in the upper body, what we're discovering often is where we habitually tighten because of postural problems, because we've been disconnected from the body. And then, then you get the tension. And so the meditation can really help you dissolve those areas of tension. Ideally, when you work with pain, you work with it to understand it, not to get rid of it. But of course, if there's aversion, then that's the desire to get rid of it. There is a, so it's there, it's part of the reality. But working with those knots of tension and dissolving them is a very good thing to do. And it, it's part of allowing the energy to flow through the body. As you get more concentrated, the, en- the energy, the prana that flows through the body gets stronger and stronger and stronger. As it moves up and down the body, particularly up the body, and it hits areas of tension, and it's like whammo, and that's where you get the, uh, the, the tightening up and, and, and the strong pain coming. So what you want to do is dissolve that block and allow the energy to flow. And that's partly posture, the slight adjustment in the posture. Sometimes you as, you, as you breathe, you can sweep awareness through or even around the area of tightness. Sometimes if you put the awareness into the area of tightness, it will tighten up more because the quality of the effort in the awareness isn't right. And so you, you find you might exaggerate, make it worse. Then maybe you step back and just send the awareness around the, the tightness. So it's like you're massaging it from the outside with the awareness. Plus, you know, working on the, the, the subtle adjustments with the posture. Well, sometimes I can, I can imagine my frame is larger than it is. Mm. I suppose that's going around it. Yeah. And then it relaxes out and meets Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good way of doing it. Yeah. So I, no, I think that's a very valid and useful uh, part of the practice because. You're, you're creating a, a body which can handle the current, essentially, of, of the concentration. Yeah. So the Tibet practice, I think you might have just answered my question. The notion of um, what you focus on, you create. Mm-hmm. I guess what I'm hearing is that if you're concentrating on the pain, you're focusing on it and it could get worse. Whereas if you step back with awareness, that gives it a, that's the softness. Yeah. yeah, it's the quality of the concentration. You can focus in on it and not make it worse if you're really delicate with the concentration. It's a question of the effort factor. The Buddha talks about, in the Eightfold Path, when he talks about meditation, he talks about right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. Now, effort is the active aspect. That's the doing aspect. If that's out of balance, if, for example, my doing is infected by strain, aversion, fear, whatever, then the quality of of effort with the awareness messes it up. And that's when it'll, it'll start to get worse. 
But if that quality of effort is just right, then I can go in there and it doesn't make it worse. It depends on the delicacy with which you do it. So sometimes it's best to step back from it because that's when you can get that, uh, that sense of softness that you talked about, which indicates the right effort. So I can get right effort if I just step back. If I don't get too close. And then you get a sense of what that is, and then you can get closer in, maybe, with retaining that same sense of softness, of bright effort. So you, you play around with it. To me, it's, it's very largely the relationship to the effort factor when you're working with pain. If it's out of whack, because of the pain is an expression of strain, the aversion to the pain creates more strain, and so when we go in there, we import that strain with, it, with us then that's not going to work, that's going to get in the way. So sometimes then that's when it's best to, to step back and work with it from a distance. Does that make any sense? Yeah. yeah. Mm. And, and it's more definitely a type of description of it. It doesn't get so intense. Mm. And it will seem to be a lot, a lot easier. Yep. In your mind, you're, you're, not, you're not making that aversion arise. Yep. Yeah, that's an important point. Using the naming and being creative with the naming. That's why I don't like to use the word pain. Um, because pain has that negative concept. Sometimes if you're using naming you can get a sense of what your relationship is by noticing the tone of voice with which you name. Stabbing! Stabbing! <laughs> it's like you can tell from the harshness of the voice that the aversion, the stress is in there with the awareness itself. So being creative with the names and finding names that don't carry that aversive charge is, is a very good idea, yeah. And so I think it's very important. So something neutral like simply sensation or touch. I often use just the word touch. Or playing around with the names to find the right name that will express both the experience but also your relationship to it, of going in there without the aversion, but just, just you know, very, very gently being with it. Yeah, and again, that sense of distance can be quite important. Sometimes it's useful for any meditation object to go in close and be very detailed, and sometimes it's very useful to step back and get a broader picture. Both are very valid approaches, and part of this clear understanding that we're talking about is recognising when is it fruitful to go in, when is it fruitful to stay out. And that's part of the skill that you develop over time.